she can sing or she can scream. <laughs> but she still pissed me off. Rock and Roll, an adult animated musical science fiction fantasy film from the early 1980s. That was a mouthful. Created by a Canadian animation studio called Nelvana, it was their first animated feature film. And it was very close to almost being their last. We'll get to that in a moment. But Rock and Roll always stood out to me for a handful of reasons. It has fluid animation, bizarre character designs, an interesting setting in a post-apocalyptic world, and of course, as the name of the movie implies, a healthy dose of rock and roll. Going off an $8 million budget, Nirvana put their best foot forward and attempted to make something that could establish their name in the theatrical animation industry. But unfortunately for them in this case, it was not to be. Rock and Roll was released in 1983 and, get this, only made $30,000 at the box office. It was unequivocally a financial disaster. I don't think I've ever seen a film perform this badly before. Those results are so much worse than Delgo, and that's saying something. Enough it's about them. Let's talk about you. So, what happened? Why was Rock and Roll such a huge failure, despite having legitimate talent involved with its production? Well, let's find out. The 1970s were such a bizarre era for animation. Disney wasn't putting out their best work and were somewhat stumbling around. Meanwhile, you had adult animation actually making a name for itself, with the likes of Fritz the Cat by Ralph Bakshi, for example. But in 1971, a new studio arrived on the scene, and it went by the name of Nirvana. Stationed out of Toronto, Ontario, it was founded by Michael Hirsch, Patrick Lobert, and Clive A. Smith, to which the latter of the three had previously worked on Yellow Submarine and also the Beatles cartoon. That was a weird show. I wonder if anyone is home. Did you just how luck there is? This combo of animation and rock and roll got its first chance to shine with a TV special, The Devil and Daniel Mouse from 1978. It's about a 20 minute long special. It follows these two mice. One's a guy, one's a girl. They want to be rock and roll stars and the girl mouse sells her soul to the devil. The guy goes to court with like the denizens of hell and rescues her and that's the entire special. And for what it's worth, it's pretty neat. I wouldn't say it's great. The animation's something else. I mean, just look at this devil guy. I call Beelzebub, otherwise known as me. You can really see how this special would be the inspiration for Nirvana to go on and do rock and roll. Oh, by the way, fun fact, George Lucas was apparently a big fan of this studio, and he even commissioned them to do the animated segment of the Star Wars Holiday Special. You know, the one where Han Solo's face is melting off of his skull. Oh man, you look rough. And this is also the first time that Boba Fett ever made an appearance, so that's kind of cool. I take it you have no love of the Empire. I don't. Well, neither do I. So before Nirvana started production on Rock and Roll, they were actually approached by Heavy Metal, which is another film from that era. I haven't seen it yet, but I believe it's like this anthology series, also intended for an older audience, and they asked Nirvana if they wanted to work on that movie, to which Nirvana turned them down. They said, no thank you, we're gonna focus on our own film, Rock and Rule. They officially launched production for the movie in 1979 and will go on to team up with United Artists as the main distributors for their film. Again, the 1970s were an era of experimental animation, where adult content was getting more attention, and Rock and Roll wanted to be among those names. It wanted to be a film to stand up and say, check it out, we're not Disney, we're for an older audience who likes rock and roll. 
They were very passionate and confident that this movie would be a hit with their viewers. They even picked up some pretty hot musicians from around that time to work on the movie and do a soundtrack for it. You got Debbie Harry, Cheap Trick, Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, Earth, Wind & Fire. Like legitimately, the soundtrack for rock and roll is very good. To which, if the name of your movie is Rock and Roll, well, you should probably have a good soundtrack. So The main folks behind rock and roll when it came to writing, directing, producing, were the original founders of Nirvana, so the three guys I mentioned before. Once more, they were pushing hard for this movie to do well. Even with a substantial budget of $8 million, they still pushed themselves really hard to put their best foot forward, to provide quality, fluid animation that was high quality and looked good. But disaster struck Nirvana. As United Artists was purchased by MGM in 1981 for $380 million, an event that would have a ripple effect and would go on to ruin the release of Rock and Rule. According to my sources, MGM bought UA after the disaster of a film called Heaven's Gate. Ooh, those numbers. I guess we've got ourselves a bit of a theme going on in this video. It's evil. Rock and Roll would be released in April of 1983. But MGM deliberately throttled the release of the movie because they did not care for it. They didn't know how to market a film like this to an audience. They thought it was crude, that it was sexual, that it was violent and had too many adult themes about it. Well, duh, it's an adult movie. But they did not care. They marketed the movie in a very bizarre, particular way that involved very few movie theaters. And because of that, the movie only made about $30,000 at the box office. It was an absolute mess. And to top it all off, MGM went back into the film and butchered it up. They changed the voice of one of the main characters, Omar. They took that voice actors out because apparently MGM did not like that voice. And they replaced Omar with American Graffiti's Polly Matt. Or Paula Matt. I'm not sure how you say your name, dude. On top of this, they would go back and change scenes, chopping out some stuff, editing the opening crawl that explains the setting of the world. It was incredibly bizarre what they were cherry picking and editing and altering for the film. And most of this was for the American release. So when it comes to the actual film in its entirety, America never got that until many years later. Fortunately, Canada got the original release with Omar's voice still in there, with the original edits. But yeah, at that point, it was a failure. There was nothing they could do to save it. MGM screwed Nelvana. It completely screwed rock and roll. It was a failure, and it almost put Nelvana out of business. Now, fortunately for Nelvana, they went to television and started to do projects for Inspector Gadget, The Care Bears, cartoon shows that could help them make up their loss, and actually did. They were able to bounce back, and Nelvana is still in business to this very day. Now, here's a couple of fun facts I wanted to list off about Rock and Roll, despite its failure of a launch. First off, the original cut that was widescreen was lost in a fire. So what they had originally that was intended for audiences was lost. So that sucks. Now they had another version that was able to salvage the film in its entirety, but as far as the full widescreen goes, that was lost. Which kind of explains things, because when I watch these different versions of the film, I notice that sometimes it's 4x3, sometimes it is occasionally widescreen, it's a hodgepodge of edits, and I don't know exactly what brought about so many different kinds of versions of this movie, but something went wrong, <laughs> which is no surprise because Nirvana has the worst luck apparently. Now, this film became a bit of a cult classic throughout the years, where it was hard to get a copy, that the copies that were in circulation were incredibly rare, and that when there were viewing parties, it took place at conventions, and the movie was even incorrectly sourced, saying that Ralph Bakshi was the director 
when that's not the case. There's also something about how if you wanted a copy of the movie, you could have sent 80 bucks to Nirvana and they would mail you back a VHS copy of the version that they had, which wasn't the widescreen version because that was lost in the fire, but the version that they currently had on stock, as in, here's what we have, it's yours. I feel bad for rock and roll. I feel really bad for Nirvana. They tried their best, they got completely screwed, and then they lost their main version of their movie in a fire. That's rough, buddy. Eventually, Rock and Roll was officially released on DVD in 2005 and on Blu-ray in 2010. It's also up on YouTube, which is good. I was actually wondering why I got so many requests to review this movie out of the blue. And I was like, where did this come from? Why is everybody emailing me the same thing? Only to realize, ah, it's up on YouTube now. That's why, which is good. I'm glad that folks are checking out this film. It is definitely one for the ages. And I'm glad that I'm finally getting around to talking about it. But that being said, is it actually any good? Well, let's take a look. Nothing can stop me. All right, so what's the movie about? I told myself I'll hold back on spoilers, but forgive me, there might be some here, so take it for what it's worth. The film starts off with an opening crawl that describes the setting, how it's a post-apocalyptic world, how animals like dogs and cats and rats have mutated and have become an anthro, <laughs> There it is, uh, an anthro race of intelligent, sentient creatures who have essentially replaced humanity. That the world is, I would say it's kind of an urban Mad Max, where there's order and structure to a degree, but it's like stay in the cities, everywhere outside of it is kind of dead. But that's unfortunately not explained too well. I'll address that later on here in the video. We start off with Mock who is the main villain of this film. We're following him as he's on a quest. He is talking to his computer. It's helping him track down this voice. He's got this entire scheme where he needs this one voice that can help him unlock his quest, which he reveals later on in the film, and I'll get to that. We then go to a concert in this bar where we meet our four main protagonists. Well, two of them are the main protagonist, and the other two are the sidekicks. The two main protagonists being Omar and Angel, and then the two sidekicks being Dizzy and Stretch. Dizzy and Stretch, they don't really do much in this film. They are the definition of side characters. Omar, he's a rock and roll asshole. <laughs> I mean that, I can say it because it's true. He's arrogant. He's got a massive ego. He's a diva. He thinks he's a hot shot, that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Angel feels like she lives in his shadow, that he always takes a spotlight, that she is there to support him, but never gets a chance to do her own thing. That's like one of the biggest takeaways in the film as far as character growth goes, how Omar is a selfish bastard and needs to grow up and be more supportive of Angel, especially with what's about to happen. So Angel sings her song on stage, to which Omar was not happy about, and Mock hears the song. He's like, wow, this girl's voice, mm, this is it. This is the voice I need for what I'm trying to do. He then invites her and Omar and Dizzy and Stretch over to his mansion to where we meet these three goons, these brothers who work for Mock. By the way, shout out to this scene. It's one of the greatest opening scenes to introduce a villain officially in a film. Just, just watch. Anyone want a beer? Look at this guy. It's outrageous. My God almighty, his lips shoot out of his skull. His lips should be separated as their own individual character. It is insane and I love it. I'm Mock. Omar continues to be selfish. He's being very cold to Angel. You can tell that he's jealous that she is getting all the attention. And he's not, because again, he's a diva. And this is where the main adventure begins. 
Mock kidnaps Angel. He goes to Nuke York City. Isn't that great? Sounds like a Fallout City, right? A city from the Fallout games, that is. And then the gang chases after him to go rescue Angel because she was kidnapped. Omar's being reluctant, dragging his feet, feeling indifferent. Funny enough, it's the side characters, Dizzy and Stretch, who are like, Omar, come on, we've got to save Angel. She needs our help. Omar is like, I guess. I suppose we'll go save my girlfriend. Omar sucks, by the way. He is awful. We then are introduced to other characters. Marlock, who owns this club, which was a club from the first act. You've got Cindy, who is the sister of the three brothers. She kind of reminds me of a Harley Quinn-like character, especially with her voice. And then things start to get crazy, where Mock is losing it. He tries to put on a show. There's not enough power for it. So they go back to hometown. I believe that's the uh, name of the original city they were in. So they literally went from the first setting to a second setting and then back to the first setting, which again, I have a qualm with the, the world building in this movie and I'll get to it later on. But ultimately it comes down to Mock forcing Angel to sing. And by the way, hold on. This is about to get crazy. Like you're about to get your minds blown with what Mock was trying to do. Mock uses Angel's voice to unleash a demon from hell named Armageddon to help him get revenge on the world because his last album didn't perform so well. That was Mock's main plan the entire time was to get revenge on folks and command this demon so he could rule the world. I unironically love it. I know it's got problems, but I love it. My Omar shows up, saves Angel. They sing together, both of their voices, sends the demon back to hell. Mock's sidekick kills him. And that's the movie. It ends very quickly. It's it's like, okay, here's the end. Done. And what a roller coaster it was. There is no one. Okay, so let's go over my five points. First, the story. The main characters being Angel and Omar, to me, aren't that interesting. Omar is not likable, which is fine with certain characters, but in this movie, it just doesn't work. He's incredibly selfish. He's a diva. He's arrogant and also ignorant to Angel and what she needs, which I get is the main plot point of the movie for the main characters, is how Omar isn't being supportive of Angel, but it just never clicked with me. It just felt like this is a bad guy who doesn't deserve Angel. Now, Angel is a bit better, but she's also boring. I feel like she isn't much outside of, I want to be a star someday, and get your hands off me, you villain, leave me alone. I wish she had more spice to her character, a bit more spunk, but no, she was pretty basic, and that wasn't much fun to watch. Chop, chop, same song. Omar, my song. Mock was, without a doubt, the most interesting character in the movie. He had spiced his performance to what he was trying to do, how it was a bit of a mystery that grew with the film and evolved for us to discover, oh, wow, he's trying to unleash a demon. That's crazy. And it fits well with the rock and roll theme going on in the movie. Mock is prideful. He's got a bigger ego than Omar but it works for a villain. It's almost like he fancies himself as a philosopher. There's even a scene where he's talking to one of his lackeys saying, there's no good or evil, just moral grays, and elaborates on what he's doing as okay, when in reality he's trying to kill people. Mock's interesting. The best part of the film, without a doubt. Is what we are doing evil? Of course not. The side characters are, yeah, just meh. Dizzy is like the voice of reason, trying to keep things on track. Stretch here is just for comic relief. Cindy, as I said, I liked her. She was much more interesting than Angel. I wish Cindy's spunky attitude was Angel's character, but oh well. 
It just, overall, these characters aren't that interesting, except for Mock and his lackeys. Uh, the, the lackey who was the dumb one, he was interesting as well, at least with how he was a good juxtaposition to Mock, who was a know-it-all. And then uh, I think his name is Sleazy, I believe. He's a, a complete buffoon, but he actually has a good heart. So that's good. Someone who's cold and quote unquote logical versus somebody who is emotional, but has a good soul and means well. No Santa Claus, no Tooth Fairy, and no Uncle Mikey. <laughs> As I said, uh, the setting I have issues with. I am a huge fan of post-apocalyptic worlds. Recently, Kipo, uh, I did a quick vid on that. That takes place in a post-apocalyptic setting. I loved it. Adventure Time does the same thing. Of course, Mad Max being one of my absolute favorites, especially with Fury Road, that's like one of my favorite movies ever. So when I started to watch Rock and Roll back in the day for the first time, and I saw the opening crawl, I was like, this is awesome. It's a post-apocalyptic world with uh, anthro creatures, and we get to see how they go about their lives after humanity has fallen. And it wasn't that different. It's almost like they were humans anyway. There was nothing really animal about them except for their looks. And even then, they aren't that outlandish, especially the main characters. It felt like I was watching something from Goof Troop and how I'm in the anthro world of Mickey Mouse characters. And that, I don't know, that just, that was weird to me. I felt like it was lost potential with how you could have explained this world, how it could have been a bit more like Mad Max where it's desolate and the cities that do exist are like pseudo prisons and just full of ruffians and mutants and creatures and just a lot more you could have done. But instead it felt like, oh, we're in the future. There are mutants, but we just see them once and that's it. And they aren't even really that big of a deal. Yeah, I was let down because of that. The story itself was not the best. It all hinges on Mock's plan. He's the main one making things happen. He's the one who kidnaps Angel. He's the reason why Omar and his friends are chasing them down. And when it's finally revealed that he's summoning a demon, it was... <laughs> I mean, it was shocking and cool, but then after that, it felt like anticlimactic, where it's like, oh, that's it. It felt like all the tension was zapped out of the room after the novelty reveal that it was a demon. Once more, it doesn't help that most of the characters aren't that interesting. Stretch is the comic relief. Dizzy is the voice of reason. Omar is a selfish asshole who does come around at the end, but it almost seemed like it came out of nowhere. He had no real change of heart except for just randomly showing up and being like back away angel's my girlfriend and then singing with her i wish there was more of showing him becoming good seeing that he needs to grow up and no longer be a diva or his girlfriend will die uh, but we don't get that music though music's really good music make you lose control as a topical meme the music was fantastic i loved angel's song Listen to the lyrics. I probably can't play it because copyright, but you hear her lyrics, which is done by, oh gosh, um, I forget the name, Debbie Harry. <laughs> I'll type it out because I'm getting it wrong. But Angel's song is pretty. I like the lyrics. It's meaningful with her relationship with Omar. The, the music in this movie in its entirety is good. Cheap Trick, Lou Reed, Earth, Wind and Fire, good stuff. So on that front, they delivered. But with the main course of the story, with the main characters, it felt lacking. And that's a bummer because I want to like this film. I want to enjoy it. But the story could have been much, much better. Hey, Laguna! Oh, no! Magnetic force is slowing down my brain. Next, there's the voice acting. So I said earlier in the video that Omar's voice in the original cut was replaced because apparently MGM was like, we don't like the sound of Omar's voice. Let's replace him with the guy from American Graffiti because he's popular, right? <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I do know this though, uh, Omar's voice is much better. 
Now, I am not a fan of Omar's character, but the voice they got for the redub with Paul E. Matt, mm, no thank you. He sounds even more arrogant, which I did not know was even possible. Like here, see for yourself. Here's the Canadian version with the original Omar. I just came to tell you, you were good. You were good. And here's the redub. So why'd you walk? Sometimes I walk, sometimes I talk. I'm talking now. But for the other voice actors, they were fine. Nothing outstanding, nothing awful. Mock's voice was great. I think he steals the show. And according to my sources, Nirvana actually approached Mick Jagger to voice Mock because Mock is actually modeled after Mick Jagger. His name is Mock Swagger. Isn't that great? But Mick turned it down, and instead, they went to Don Franks, who voiced Mock, and he did a great job. She can sing or she can scream, <laughs> but she still pissed me off. Then there's the dialogue. Obviously, this is a rock and roll inspired film, so I can understand the rebellious dialogue with people being short and aggressive with one another. Get out of my face, man. I'm a rock and roller. I'm rebellious. I'm a vagabond, if that's a word that applies here. I don't know. But don't talk to me unless you're talking about rock and roll, brother. I, I'm so out of touch. Give me just one good reason why you guys should finish. How about this? OK, that's one good reason. Omar is an ass. He's aggressive. He's short with people. That's his rock and roll diva-like character. Angel is a sweetheart, understanding, and also the damsel in distress. Mock, his dialogue was the best because just like his voice acting, just like his character, he is interesting, especially building up to the finale. Unfortunately, the finale, as I said, wasn't as satisfying, but leading up to it, you hear how he manipulates people, how he uses his words to twist and turn and get people to fall for his schemes. I like that. I think it works well, especially with Don Franks voicing Mock. Oh, and Cindy, again, a great character. I appreciate her dialogue with Angel, how they go to a club, how Angel is being shown around town. Cindy's saying, we're a new kind of woman. These men aren't ready for us. And Cindy's great. I think her dialogue is charming and cute. Kind of a, a girl who's trying to get out from her brother's boots because again, she's related to those three stooges and she wants to go out and live her life, but they're being protective. So Cindy, it's cool hearing her talk about how she escapes every Saturday night to go to the dance club and how her brothers constantly try to stop her, but she's always one step ahead of them. She's great. I just slide down the chute and away I scoot. I do it every Saturday night. Let's go. After that, there's the editing. Ooh, okay. Like I already said, this movie suffered from MGM, who decided to go back and gut the movie. They changed the opening crawl. They even added some new scenes in to help change the outcome of the original cut, which is very bizarre. I actually had to go and take different versions of the movie and cobble them together to get the best version of the original cut, plus some extra scenes that were created by MGM, or not by them, but I would imagine ordered by them. And that way I can get a full version of this movie, even with the extra stuff, but I digress. What I'm getting at though, is that the new things they added and the old stuff they removed really hindered the movie in its entirety, which to be fair, isn't incredible from a story perspective already. So having MGM go back and do post edits, oh, that sucked. And the one scene that is the most unforgivable to me, and I'm not sure if this was MGM or Nirvana or who was responsible, but that one stooge, the one who has a kind heart, he wants to be good. And at the end of the film, he sacrifices his life to save Angel and Omar from the demon that was being controlled by Mock. So the brother dies. It's really heartfelt scene. I feel more for this guy dying than for any of the main characters because he took a stand and died. And his brother snaps. His brother's like, you killed my brother. 
and he kills Mock in retaliation. That was good. And at the end of the movie, and again, I don't know what cut this was from, they have the guy coming back to life. Why would you do that? Why would you steal away the significance of his death and how it brought about Mock's demise? Bad edit, why would you even add that in? Stupid. So again, this movie has editing issues on a pretty massive scale. Freeze! You! Where'd he go? I think I know. Let's go. Hey! Slime! Everybody, freeze! That means you! Hey! Slime! And finally, there's the animation. The animation is the best part of the movie, hands down. It's fluid, it is high quality, it's bizarre, it's so weird. There are some really interesting faces and facial movements and body movements. It's, it's peculiar, it's bizarre, it's strange, and it's so much fun to watch. It is unlike anything else I've seen, especially with Mox lips. Just look at those things go. Look at his face. There's so much skin with his cheeks and his lips and his just everything about his facial movement and it's mesmerizing. I can't draw my eyes away from it. My name is Mark Frank Sabat. I know you love the thing you got. You can tell that these animators, the ones who worked on the film, went hard trying to make the best thing they could. They wanted to make stuff that was fluid, animation that's bizarre, and even a bit uncanny, but it works with this film. Hell, there's even some old school computer graphics in this film. Like really basic stuff, but hey, it works. And there's also the grittiness of the film that works with the post-apocalyptic setting that this film is taking place in. How the backgrounds are gritty and use darker colors, looks a bit like a wasteland in some ways and the cities look overly urban designed with technology it's a bit of a dystopian future. I, I like that stuff, it works. Again, I have issues with the settings, but when I see some of the set designs, I'm like, okay, right now with the city, with Nuke York, with these different vehicles and different uh, ships and, and designs, it works. I just wish you would have explored the world a bit more. But when it comes to this movie and its animation, I can very much so understand why it's a cult classic. It is supremely unique, and I would recommend it to any person who's a fan of animation. My dear, what's her face? Thank you for your help. It's a pleasure working with you, Mark. So, how would I improve the film? It's got issues, I'll say that. It definitely has its issues. Omar's character, Angel's character, they're boring, they aren't fun to watch, they aren't satisfying with their character growth and their character arcs. If anything, Angel didn't really change at all, and Omar's change was on a dime and wasn't satisfying. Mock was great up to a point until the end. He was interesting until he was immediately not interesting. So I would work a bit more on the characters and make them resonate with your audience a bit more. As of right now, I'm not sure how I would do that outside of trying to have some genuine change in your characters and where they start and where you want to take them. But here I stand with, I think, the true answer of how I would improve it. And that is not changing it at all. I know I just said that I would make changes and that the film's not perfect. Yes, true, it's not, and it could be improved. But part of me, my gut, is telling me, leave it as it is. This movie is so unique with its production, with its direction, with its animation, with the era that it came from, and how it got completely screwed by MGM how it was lost in a fire, how it barely survived over the years with the wrong credits to the film, how it eventually resurfaced on YouTube. I find the production and the survival of this movie much more interesting than the movie itself. And also the movie being as weird and bizarre as it is, just adds that much more to the flair 
and the appeal of this movie. The animation alone is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's not God tier fantastic, and there's some weird things that they combine where it's like, what direction are you going here? But overall, just this film's production and the direction it was trying to achieve, I think that makes the movie unique. And it's almost like from an era that we will never go back to ever again. It's a product of its time. Unlike MGM, I wouldn't touch it. I will leave it alone. So in conclusion, I would recommend Rock and Roll. I think it is worth checking out. Again, if you're a fan of animation, this one should be on your list just for the bizarre novelty that it is. It's not perfect, but I fully understand why it turned out the way it did, and I give it props for persevering over the years. I'm glad that it wasn't lost to time entirely. It was strong enough to survive to this very day, and I'm glad that it's finally up on YouTube. Hopefully, it can get the audience that was robbed from it from back in the day by MGM. Nirvana, I give you massive props. You saw your chance, you took a leap of faith, you made something that was awesome and different, you missed your window, but I think there's a certain beauty that it was able to survive and resurface, and again, hopefully, it can finally make the rounds around the internet and people can appreciate the bizarre wonder that is rock and rule. So until next week, boys and girls, goodbye and be good. Goodbye, Uncle Mikey. Hey guys, thank you for watching the video. A shout out to my patrons who support me on Patreon and a big shout out to my YouTube members. I think they're called sponsors, I think. Thank you guys for your support too. Also, I wanna thank Ryan Walterson and Jim Gisriel for helping me to research this video. You guys are awesome. Your good research buddies, and hopefully we can keep providing some good content here in the future. All right, thanks for watching. See you all next time.